Welcome. My name is uh, Ho Ming Kit, the CEO of the Singapore Business Federation and a member of uh, ABEC Singapore. Uh, we warmly welcome uh, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong uh, to the APEC uh, CEO Dialogue uh, 2020. Welcome, PM, PM Lee. Good uh, morning. Morning. Uh, we want to, I want to start a little bit more broadly in, in this uh, dialogue with you, uh, talking about uh, COVID-19. Uh, we, you know, it has uh, really immensely uh, affected not only the way we work, uh, the way we live. Uh, we're talking to you about how it has affected even personally, you know, as, as, as a leader managing uh, COVID, you know, what is your sense of the impact of uh, COVID on the global economy? And how have you as a leader found it easy or difficult to manage uh, COVID-19 in the last, what, 10 months that, that we had this crisis? Well, this year, the impact has been enormous mm. because um, the international travel has closed down the tourism business is at a halt. Um, and many countries have had to lock down or have various forms of circuit breaker to tamp down the COVID-19 in, in their societies. And that has had a massive impact on their economies, on jobs, on earnings, on the um, confidence and outlook of the population at a time of great uncertainty. Um, in, the, in Asia, many of the countries uh, have brought the COVID-19 under control, are now gradually trying to open up again, but very, very cautious because they're very concerned about the rebound, which you can see happening in Europe, you can see happening in America. And because of that, although things have stabilised, uh, the outlook is very, very guarded. Mm. Numerically, next year will be better than this year because next year, Hopefully, we avoid a lockdown and hopefully the uh, vaccines start to come online and gradually things begin to come back to normal. But I think that it will take quite some time mm. and the, there are many risks along the way. And that's how we are treating it in Singapore. Right. You, you mentioned about uh, Asia being able to manage the crisis a little bit better in terms of stabilising the domestic situation of the COVID-19. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, for example, in America, uh, they have opened, they had locked down and then they have uh, opened their economy in, during the summer. Uh, I think their economy was less, less affected, but now they are into the second wave. Whereas in Asia, I think we were a little bit more conservative. We, we, we locked down, but that has greater economic impact. Do, do you think that, that the Asia way of managing COVID-19 is, is, is the way to go? We don't know. Time will tell because the battle is far from over. So far, we are trying our best to keep our guard up and to keep the enemy at bay. You can't keep him out altogether, but when you see cases within popping up in our society and our community, we try our best to knock them out before they can become a big cluster and a big cluster can become a major outbreak. But we don't believe we have won because firstly, within our community, you don't know where it may be hiding and it can pop up again. It's a very um, wily bug and very, very hard to eradicate. Secondly, we can't keep our borders completely closed forever. We, there has to be traffic, there has to be business, people need to travel. And therefore, we are exposed to the outside world and COVID-19 is all over the world. And so we must expect cases to keep on coming in and we have to be vigilant in dealing with them when they pop up. I think that we are trying very hard to avoid having a second outbreak in a big way and having to have a second circuit breaker or a second lockdown. I think the psychology on the population, if we had to do that, would be a very big impact. Mm. People would be discouraged, maybe demoralised, certainly will be angsty and uh, fractious. Uh, it's not easy to maintain solidarity in the face of a t threat which keeps on being there, going away and coming back again, going away and coming back again. Mm. So we are trying our best to avoid that roller coaster. Is, is this made more difficult because, you know, as a, as, a, as a national leader, the toolkit that you have to tackle the crisis is mostly national. 
you know, in a sense that uh, were there, were you able to call on multilateral uh, international toolkit and collaboration to manage the, the crisis? Well, the scientific collaboration is international. Mm. I mean, people are researching COVID all over the world. Papers are being published. Everybody's reporting on their experiences, what is working, what is not working, where the unexpected pitfalls are. And we're all trying to learn from one another. So that part is international. In terms of international cooperation, looking after our borders, um, looking after working out safe travel arrangements, I think there's a good amount of that. Mm. In terms of um, medical arrangements, like um, planning for what to do when vaccines become available. Right. WHO is coordinating arrangements internationally so that you can uh, have the vaccines available even to countries which can't quite afford them and so that you have a rational distribution to the places where it can make the most difference to the global pandemic. Mm. That means the, the most vulnerable people and the first responders should get it first. And we are participating in those initiatives. We've made a contribution and we are also what's called Friends of the COVAX, right. uh, which means um, w working together with other countries to, and with WTO uh, to sort out these arrangements and to make sure that those who need it are not deprived of vaccines because they can't afford it. We, we had, uh, in the earlier part of the, the, the crisis, disruption to supply chain, yes. particularly for medical supplies yes. and essential medical supplies. Yes. So gloves, masks, it, it, it was PPE. disappointing for us to, to see... Well, what to do? It's a scramble. Everybody, everybody is short and every country bends the rules as far as it can and sometimes even further in order to grab and get first claim on stuff which is within their control. Mm. Were, were you disappointed that the WTO didn't play a part in, in or, or original organisation didn't play a part in making sure that those, those rules are observed? Well, I and think it's very hard for a supranational organisation to make sure that the rules are observed because finally governments are sovereign and if the government decides it wants to do something within its own territory, there's not much you can do about it. Mm. But there is certainly a lot more scope for cooperating between governments because uh, it... You, the next time it happens, we will need to work together better. Mm. And if each time we are going to scramble for PPE and for gloves and for masks, then each one of us must set up factories to, build PPE, to make PPE and manufacture gloves and masks mm. and, is an off, and stockpile them. And it's an awfully expensive business. So within ASEAN, we are talking about possibilities of uh, cooperating to stockpile, to ensure supplies of these essential items in an emergency. But of course, the test will be, will it work when the emergency comes? Mm, mm. I hope so. Right. PM, you, you, you mentioned uh, yeah, about COVID and whether we would be able to return to normal. Uh, we are, you know, at the Business Federation, we are telling our members that UNITE might not be able to return to the normal even post-COVID. Do, do you share that view? I think it will take some time, uh, and some time meaning several years, and there will surely be changes from where we were in the new normal. In the short term, I don't see us getting away from the precautions and the uh, risks which are present right now uh, overnight. It is not possible. Winter is coming in the Northern Hemisphere. Their cases are likely to, uh, are currently continuing to grow. And even if you start having a vaccine by beginning of next year, by the time it gets rolled out to a significant proportion of the population and has an impact in slowing down the spread of the disease, it will be probably 2022. Mm. And so we must continue to be prepared for this kind of situation for some time. And I think travel is not going to return to normal next year. Mm. Maybe in two years' time, you'll have it will be possible to extend in a bigger way, but that's down the road. So I think that will take time, and I think even after COVID is gone, there will be lasting changes. I mean, people have gotten used to working remotely, to yeah. meeting, to doing business online, to trading and buying things, um, making commitments online, and um, to being more, to traveling less. Mm. And I, think those will be lasting impacts. Did you, did you uh, 
did you feel that even at the at the leaders level, because you were all meeting virtually online, yes, were you missing something? Uh, for the meeting for proper, it's not so bad because the meeting propers tend to be formal events, and mm. we each say our piece. So we online or not, you listen to one another. But what you miss is the informal interactions, yes. the chance to chat, a bit of corridor, serendipitous meeting when you just bump into somebody and you have a useful exchange and he pick up something useful or you share a bit of tidbit of information. Mm. Uh, those human contacts, unfortunately, are lost. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the same feedback. And, and, really. and yeah. for, the, for the leaders whom you, have, whom you have known before, you're carrying on a relationship, right. continuing that is okay. But for the leaders whom you have not yet met, yes. to get to know them right. for the first time, mm. Uh, I think that's more difficult. I mean, I met Mr. Abe, for example, the Japanese Prime Minister, many times over mm. uh, the dozen years when he was Prime Minister. And now there's Mr. Suga, and I've spoken to him mm. on the phone. Uh, but I have, and I've uh, met him virtually at the ASEAN meetings, but I have not met him in person. And mm. you do need to engage in person for him to know what you are like and for you to feel what he is like. Yeah. I think and it's to become the, comfortable with one another. It's, I think it's the same perspective from, from businesses. Yes. Yeah. I, I think to, 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 to sign a new contract or, or to develop a new yeah, business you, you relationship. You need the feel of the person. Well, yeah. Can I trust him? Does he over-promise or does he over-deliver? If I sign, will I get satisfaction? If I run into trouble, will I have a reasonable counterparty? Very hard to answer these questions just by looking <laughs> on the screen. So do you look forward to a, a physical meeting next year? Uh, yes, I do. But I hope that there will be a good combination because not all meetings need to be physical. And I think in the old arrangements, perhaps we were travelling around the world more than was ideal. <laughs> and then we could cut that back some. Mm -hmm. uh, so you still maintain the contact, but uh, perhaps not quite as intensely. That would be ideal. I think we'll get to a... A nice compromise, I think, post-COVID. I um, hope so. Yeah. PM, I think, if I may, turn, turn to the situation in Singapore. I think uh, amidst this very difficult uh, 10, 10 to 12 months that... Uh, I think Singapore has not done too badly. You know, our uh, COVID numbers are very low. There's almost no uh, community transmission in the past few days. Uh, we have the lowest fertility, uh, fatality rate in terms of COVID in the world. And uh, I think businesses are, are looking forward to uh, a reopening of the uh, economy at the end of the year, hopefully, if not early next year. So, uh, you know, we, we are doing some of this job matching and actually uh, even hotels are rehiring, uh, people in FNB are rehiring. So there's a little bit of buzz in the street now. You know, I think this is coming at the back of a very robust you know, response, I think not only by the Singapore government, but, but by many governments of actually putting fiscal support to, to, to workers as well as uh, to, to businesses. I wanted you to, PM, if you could share with our audience Singapore's response, uh, COVID response for our businesses and, and, and workers, and what drives those responses? Well, first of all, a disclaimer. We don't claim victory. The battle is not over. Uh, we are taking it very seriously and we're very aware that things can still go wrong very quickly. Mm. And all you need is one super spreader and we'll be chasing our tails again. Mm. It can easily happen. But what we need to do is to keep up our precautions, build up what we're able to do in terms of testing, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of our systems to uh, respond in case the cases grow again and then be able to open up cautiously with precautions so that I can take steps one by one safely mm. and not just take steps and hope for the best. Mm. And then become in a more normal state. What we, the attitude we took from the beginning was that we do not want to, what we do not want to let the disease burn through our population. We wanted to keep our population safe. At the same time, we knew that this would have a big impact on the economy. And therefore, the government had to step up in a major way in order to preserve jobs and to make sure our businesses survive to the extent possible. Mm. And so we have taken very 
major fiscal measures, uh, one budget package after another. This year we've had the main budget plus four more supplementaries, of altogether five budgets. And we've spent a vast amount of money. We've taken not just money from our, what uh, resources we have, but we've dipped into our reserves, into the piggy bank. And we've taken 50 plus billion dollars of past reserves, protected reserves, with the permission of the president, which we had to seek specially, in order to give, to help pay for uh, salaries through a job support scheme, in order to support companies, which particularly the companies which are in very badly hit sectors like tourism and travel, in order to have job growth initiatives, in order to, to, to subsidize companies to hire new workers for new jobs, and to look after also the self-employed people, because mm. they particularly were very badly hit when mm. uh, COVID came. Mm. Many of them are tour guides, some are taxi drivers, some are freelance uh, coaches, uh, trainers, they may be entertainers, and uh, they, they all desperately needed help. So mm. the first thing to do was to keep body and soul together. And that took a lot of resources. And I think it has prevented um, a lot of hardship and kept the economy at least nose above water mm. afloat. Now that its situation is stabilizing, uh, we cannot continue this very, very large infusion of uh, government resources indefinitely. And we have gradually to tail this off and to get things onto a sustainable footing, mm. which means that the businesses which are able to resume should resume. The businesses which need to transform or to pivot to a new orientation because it's a new normal and the old way of doing things won't work anymore. We will help you to do that. And for the few businesses which are likely to be in suspended animation for some time, mm. like tourism, travel, uh, then we will have to make special arrangements for them. Mm. But eventually this has to be sustainable and we, we have to adapt ourselves to what is to come, rather than freeze a position which reflected what was pre-COVID. Right. Otherwise, we'll end up with zombie companies and an unproductive economy. And I think that will lead to more trouble for us later on. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know talking to our, our members, I think they are all deeply appreciative of the government's support. Uh, you know, but we, we in the Federation, of course, worry that this support is not sustainable going forward. Yeah. As you say, you, we've given 52 billion yeah. uh, of our reserve to support. So, so we worry about the, the transition uh, when, when those support is, yes. is scaled down. We have no sense, uh, PM, what, uh, how many companies will fall out as a result of the transition. Well, some industries are not doing badly. If you look at manufacturing, it's doing quite well. In fact, we have growth in manufacturing this year compared to last year, even electronics, for example, or pharmaceuticals. Uh, if you look at the tech industries, they are doing well. IT, uh, the, the, the tech companies like Google, Facebook, in right. fact, they are doing brilliantly during this right. period. And some of them have presence in Singapore. So there are sectors which are doing well. There are other sectors which will resume there will be business, but it will not be quite at the old level, mm. like construction, mm. where there will always be a need demand because there's so much of public construction which is necessary. You need trains, schools, houses, yeah. tra uh, uh, new housing estates, hospitals. They need to be built, and we have to get the industry restarted in a safe way, right. which means testing, which means segregation, it means additional costs. It means the government has to step in and help to do things, get things done as efficiently as possible. And um, we may need to do, adjust the cost structure as well. Uh, so there will be those industries which need specific attention. Um, and then you have the ones which are, I think the ones which are most anxious are the entertainment and tourism business. Right. And we're trying experiments to see how we can allow the entertainment outlets to open up safely but it's very, very challenging. Mm. Mm. Because the whole point of entertainment mm. is that you go to That's let right. your hair yeah. down. Mm. Mm. Whereas here, we are trying to keep your guard, our guard up. And what, even if you have rules when you want to relax and have a drink, and then 
and uh, sing some um, song or dance in an entertainment lounge, karaoke. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different mindset altogether. Yeah. But I think we are, we are aided by innovation in, in the sense of we, we have apps like contract tracing, well, yes. so safe, we, safe so, distancing. So, so we so have we, apps to track you, to track who's been close to you, to know if you, to, to, to track the, place, the places where you have gone to, will know if you have been there. So that is helpful. But if in the place where you have been, you meet a few hundred people and then you are close to them and exchange germs with them. Yeah. Uh, well, by the time I find out, even if I know whom you touched, a few hundred people are, are ill and I'll be running around. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... It's I, happened in Seoul, it's happened in, in uh, ski resorts in Europe, it's happened in pubs in London, it's happened at birthday parties and funerals in America. And it happened to us too. We had a Chinese New Year party, this at the beginning, right. at Safra Jurong, and uh, suddenly uh, we outbreak dozens of people uh, from one uh, event. Yeah, but we are also telling our businesses that actually as much of their future can be decided by what they do themselves in terms of the safe management measures that they themselves put in place. Yes. Yeah. So that I, being I think a responsible, they want to do this. I yeah, see a lot of yeah. businesses have put up the safe entry QR code right. so that yeah. their, their customers can uh, yeah. uh, check in and uh, um, keep a log of what has happened, where they have been. Uh, I think that the businesses want to keep their own staff safe too because right. if their staff are, are sick or are SHN or quarantine, it's very disruptive for yes, them. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Prime Minister, we moved on to uh, uh, Asia Pacific APEC. Uh, I think coming out from, I think, a very successful uh, ASEAN summit, and then over the weekend uh, with the East Asian summit, and of course, culminating in the signing of the RCEP, I think uh, on the, the attention will now shift to uh, APEC, yes. as well as to the, B20, the G20 as well. Uh, with, with, with RCEP, I think uh, certainly as far as the business community is concerned, and that, that's really something that we cheered because this is part of our recommendation, yes. a bank recommendation yes. to the leaders that we must have deeper uh, economic uh, uh, integration and that FTAP must remain our goal. And yes. one of the important pathways was RCEP. Yes. So with the signing of RCEP, and also with a, with a change in the US administration to the Biden administration, what is your sense in APEC? Are we, uh, my sense has been in the last couple of years uh, that APEC is a little bit in what we call, I would call personally as a suspended animation as well. Do you, do you, see, do you well, see things coming back on track? Well, the RCEP is a big step forward. Yeah. Uh, we've spent eight years uh, negotiating it, working on it. Finally, it's signed. Uh, we were hoping for 16 members, but we had 15. Mm. India decided not to join in at, towards the end. Uh, we are disappointed, but we hope one day India will join in. Right. Because it makes strategic sense for them, and I think in the long term, it makes economic sense for them too. But they have political considerations, and I can understand that, but I hope that they will find their way into it at some point. Uh, RCP is an important signal that in, in Asia, uh, the countries do want to deepen regional integration, do want to free up trade further, do want to work with one another on, in, in a, on a plurilateral basis. That means in a group and not just bilaterally one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the world. In Asia, there is that determination to work together and to prosper together. I think that's a very good signal. Um, for APEC, as you say, in the last few years, progress has been very slow. Uh, mainly, well, or one of the reasons is because I think the U.S. approach has been that they want to deal with issues bilaterally rather than in a multilateral basis with mm. mu multiple partners together in a group. And also, they have not been um, supportive of trade as a win-win proposition. I mean, mm. the attitude of the Trump administration is that uh, this is a win-lose proposition. If I have a surplus trade surplus with you, that's good for me. If I have a trade surplus, trade deficit with you, that's bad for me. And trade is not like that. Trade is win-win. I may have a surplus with you, I have a deficit with somebody else. 
But if, it doesn't matter as long as overall it balances out. Uh, but that has been the, this administration's view, and this administration is still in charge until 20th of January. So uh, I don't think that they are likely to change their position at this la late stage, mm. but we'll have to see how the new Biden administration plays it. Mm. I think they'll be more multilateralist. Okay. I think that they'll be more supportive of the WTO mm. and of APEC. I'm not sure that they'll be more keen on throwing the doors wide open mm -hmm. or joining the CPTPP because mm -hmm. that depends on domestic politics too. And mm -hmm. once the uh, restrictions are in, uh, it's a very delicate matter rethinking your position and deciding whether you want to go back to where you were or how do you move forward. So I think that will take a while, but I hope that there will be a more constructive uh, approach one which, uh, where countries work together rather than against one another, and one where we aim to harvest win-win gains mm. rather than treat this as a win-lose proposition. What about uh, the US relationship with China? Because I think that is very important in That's deciding crucial. the plan. Yeah. That's crucial. I th in, in terms of the overall tenor, I suspect that there will remain many difficult issues to deal with mm. because um, on both sides, in the US as well as in China, attitudes have hardened a lot in recent years. The US sees, many people in the US see China as a strategic um, threat to them, and this is bipartisan. And quite a number of observers in China think that the US is out to thwart their development and rise and they are determined not to let the U.S. Put, stop their development. And so attitudes have hardened on both sides, whoever is the, in power in America, in Washington. But I hope that it will be a more coherent, systematic approach, one which will take into account a broader range of U.S. interests, not just a trade balance, but also their overall relationship with China and the overall interest which the U.S. has in the Asia-Pacific mm. and in the world mm. to be setting the, setting the standard, to be showing the way, to be leading, playing a leading role as really uh, the, the, the most powerful country in the world, playing a leading role, showing how the world can be a safe place for countries big and small. Mm. And taking care of America's interests does not mean having to ride roughshod over other countries' interests. Mm. One, uh, one of uh, APEC's strengths is, is the ability for like-minded countries, uh, advanced and as well as uh, not advanced, working together on common interests and issues. And you know, to me, I think uh, some of the important issues going forward uh, as a result of COVID-19 uh, is the collaboration that we can can uh, come together on the digital economy, you know, uh, and also things like uh, safe travel. Mm. You know, uh, the, I think APEC provides that platform for you to do this yes. kind of thing. Do, yes. you, do, do you see that as, as important uh, platforms for APEC and important priorities for the future? I think these and, are important yeah. things for APEC to discuss. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we will make an arrangement which will involve all of the APEC participants, I think 21 countries, right. uh, simultaneously. But APEC is a forum where we can talk about them and then subgroups of the countries can come together and can work things out. Uh, the digital economy particularly is an area of uh, considerable potential because as volume has grown, a lot of business is done there, then you need to have countries talking to one another to standardise rules, to standardise, uh, to, to make sure the interfaces can connect with one another and we can transact with one another and digital documents can be shared and recognised mm. and I can... Um, have information flows with rules regulated, what needs to stay within the country, what can be stored overseas, abroad. And so we have digital partnership agreements now right. being signed. It's important to set the rules there in a new area, which is still growing, and therefore there is the chance to get things right, rather than to try and put right 
things which have developed and gone into a certain way over a period of time. So digital is important. Uh, I think travel is also important. You need rules. You cannot just go back to the old days where you buy a ticket today and within a few hours you get onto the plane and you'll turn up and you don't need a visa and then, well, you, you, you have a weekend somewhere in the region or maybe you're across the world to do some business. But you need um, agreements on what is safe, how to have corridors, how to have green lanes, how to have travel bubbles, how to do the testing, how to track, how to adjust your rules when circumstances change. For example, if you have a, a travel bubble with somebody and then oh, I have new cases pop up or he has new cases pop up, mm. well, what do we do? Mm. Can, should, we can't be frozen, say the bubble is blown. I have to have some way to, to, to say pause and I tamp down, I, I, I squeeze down for a while until things stabilize again, then I can open up again. So these are all things which need to be discussed and I hope will be discussed in APEC. Mm. One, one of the, the points that struck me when I, when I looked at the ASEAN recovery uh, framework documents that was issued as a result of yeah. the ASEAN summit last, last week uh, was the emphasis placed on human security, you know, uh, that, that means protecting lives, protecting jobs. Yes. Do, do you feel that this is an area, because as, I think as businesses, to be fair, it's not really very high up in the business priority. Oh, I think for the government, it's very high up the priority. Yeah. Because really, people need to be safe, need to feel safe, and then they can give, put their energies and their attention onto their work and their businesses. Mm. The business, of course, wants to keep their business going. But from the government's point of view, it has to be a balance and looking, keeping people safe and their jobs, as well as their health, as well as their families, is a very big emphasis. In America, that is one of the divides. Uh, the, the Democrats tend to, put, tend to talk about, emphasize, tend to emphasize keeping people safe from COVID and mm. health-wise. Mm. And then the uh, Republicans and their supporters tend to talk about the economy and keeping businesses going, uh, even at the risk of COVID bursting out and, uh, and, and it costing lives. And I would say on Singapore's behalf, I, I would come down on the side of making sure that people are safe and healthy mm. and, can, and well treated medically. And then having secured that, I make sure that I look after my economy. But we, ha we will not forget the businesses. <laughs> no, businesses are, you know, in, in Singapore, we are all very uh, looking forward with anticipation, this uh, travel corridor, air travel corridor between Singapore and Hong Kong. That's right, air uh, travel bubble. That's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's well, that's supposed to start, I think. 22nd of November. That's right. That's right. And some, most of the flights uh, are booked, booked already. already. Yes. So I hope the cases remain low. No, I'll be trying to advocate this arrangement for the, some of the APEC economy. So, so if we can do that, I hope well, we can travel possible, next year. Well, it's possible, but both sides have to be confident in one another and the situation has to be quite tightly controlled on both sides in order for this to happen. Mm. If you have a, a difference, I have few cases, you have many cases, I'm afraid of you. If I have more cases than you, you're afraid of me. Yeah. So once you have that kind of a relationship, it's very difficult to, to, to open up. And even if both sides' cases are low, I mean, having been there before and experienced the trauma of uh, a major outbreak, uh, the, the population will be neurologic and mm. will be very anxious that if you open up, will that mean uh, cases will come in and therefore put us at risk again? And we have to take this uh, political reality into account. And it's not just a political reality, it's a very understandable, understandable human reaction. Mm. And we have to reassure people not to worry, we are moving step by step. There are some risks and there will be, likely you will see some cases, but we have to keep, those, we are doing our best and we will keep those cases under control. Mm. And it, provided we can do that, then we can move a little bit further. Thank you, Prime Minister. I, maybe the, the last question I want to ask is really on behalf of the participants, many of the CEOs here, you know, uh, I think they are facing uh, a very much an uncertain future is still foggy and murky. Uh, what would be your advice for business leaders in this time? I'm not a businessman. I hesitate to preach. But in, in this situation, I think you have to 
look forward, not back to what was, but look forward. COVID will have a very big impact on all kinds of businesses, some for the better, some for the worse, and make an objective assessment. What does it mean for your business and how can you best advance it? You may have to pivot, you may have to transform, you may have to right size, you will have difficult decisions to make, but take good care of your people and remember that your, your people are also stakeholders and are an important resource for you. Mm. And look after them during this difficult period. Don't just make a short, quick decision. I'm saving costs and I must drop so many headcount. But take care of them, retrain them if possible, redeploy them if possible. And I think they repay that to you and to your company, and in the process, we will strengthen our cohesion and one day we'll prosper again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, PM, uh, uh, for giving this uh, very important insight to uh, our participants. I think you've uh, spent uh, this morning uh, talking about an important subject uh, for all of us. Uh, myself, personally, I have a couple of wishes. One is 2021. I do hope to be able to travel, I, you know, that's, that's one. And I, I hope that we will rebound a lot stronger, particularly this, this part of the economy. And, and, and maybe the, my last hope is, uh, is that APEC leaders, you know, APEC leaders get to meet physically in uh, 2021. That, that would be my hope. I wish that this uh, wishes will come true next year. I yeah. look forward to that. I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.